for challenges for the children. And so you have these teachers who work so hard, and these students who come great distances. They walk a far distance, they make a great sacrifice to come to school. Often their parents lose the children as an income earner, or many of the children wake up very early to do chores in order to come to school. The teachers come a great distance, and they face all of these challenges that they shouldn't face. Like, this is what amazes me the most, and why we are humbled, is how excited children here are to receive an education. When the government, we read about the elections, and we heard about some of the challenges in the last elections, but what the world community didn't hear about were the elections prior. There was a changeover when the president came to power, and one of the first pieces of legislation he passed was making education free for every child. <coughs> And a million more children showed up to go to school. Just to put that into context, how excited kids are in Kenya about receiving an education. And I was asking the headmaster how many students he now has. 500 students. And can I ask how many boys and how many girls? Yeah, right now I have uh, 235 boys. Uh, right now. 235 boys, therefore? Now we have uh, from uh, now ECD class, I have 87. Yes. ECD, that one is uh, ECD class. Yes. Yes, we have also more girls than boys. Which is, if I can just pause that for a moment, is a extraordinary statement. In, and that's, that's amazing. And that shows the leadership to make parents feel comfortable and realizing the importance of sending their kids to school and recognize the importance of education for girls, and eliminating the barriers for girls. Sorry. Yes, um, so the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, eight goals, the number one is education. The goal that was set was to provide universal basic primary education. To put it into a global context, you have 113 million kids between 5 and 11 who have never once stepped foot into a classroom. So 113 million in our world. The vast majority is in Sub-Saharan Africa. The Millennium Development Goals were created on the eve of the millennium. They were created when more than 160 heads of state came together in New York for the UN gathering, marking the change of the century. It was the largest ever gathering, still to this day, the largest ever gathering of, UN, uh, of heads of state for any purpose. And they created these incredibly ambitious goals. And they sat to look at what would it take to truly eliminate poverty in our world. And I know that seems like a, sh a shocking idea because people say poverty has existed forever. And some people say it's always going to exist. But it doesn't have to be that way. Every World Bank and every IMF, International Monetary Fund, and every academic who's ever studied it said we can end poverty. And this was the roadmap they put out. And the number one goal, and we're going to talk about the other goals, but the number one goal they put because it's fundamentally the cornerstone goal was education. And to understand the importance of education, if you provided universal primary education, you'd prevent seven million new AIDS infections over the next 10 years. Because in the schools here, they not only teach reading, writing, and arithmetic, they teach about HIV AIDS. They teach how to protect yourself. We look and we're gonna to talk tomorrow with women and we're gonna walk with women to learn more about their lives and invite them to lunch. And when you look at gender empowerment, and one thing, a theme that's going to emerge a lot of is there's a big imbalance in the communities. And often young women don't necessarily have the same opportunities as young men. And the key to that gender rebalance is basic primary education. The UN's shown three years of basic education makes a significant difference in family income, family planning, and health. For democracy to function, for our counselor here, you know, for, for, for a true democratic process that brought him to power as a leader, we need education to learn about your rights, to learn about the UN Millennium Development Goals, to, to learn about what a democracy is in a country, to, to be able to read a newspaper, to be able to count the money that you earn. So many of these issues interconnect. Like to paint a human picture to it, we first started as an organization working on education in India was the first region where we ever built a development project. It was a rescue home. And the reason we built it there is we would go into communities, and this still happens to this day, where you would find parents 
who never learned to read and write. And middlemen would come to the villages and they would show them what they called a contract. And it was a piece of paper. And the parents couldn't read this. And with this, they would sell their child in India into slavery. And the parents, as they understood it, said that they would take their child for one year to work in a factory. And the parents couldn't read this, and they couldn't even sign their name to it, and so they took their thumbprint, and you put your thumb in ink, and then you put your thumbprint at the bottom of the page, and that's how you sign your name if you've never learned to read and write. And with that, they actually sold their children. You know, it's, it's parts of the world where we see how when you haven't received an education, you don't know your most basic and fundamental rights. It's something we take for granted in North America, basic primary education, secondary education. But with all the kids, you know, I'm sure that Robin would say she's ever met here in Kenya, or that other kids I've ever met anywhere in my travels, you stop and ask them their greatest dream, and they'll say it's a chance to go to school. So every issue fundamentally ties first and foremost to education. And that's why the school becomes the cornerstone of our adoptive village development model. Because the first step is this basic primary education, but often girls can't go to school because they have so many chores they have to do, and boys, but especially girls. And so, I don't know if you can see all the way where there's a clearing of trees. You see thick trees, and then there's suddenly there's an abrupt stop. For those of you, I know there's the blocking, some of you as the classrooms. That's all the way down to the river's edge. And we're going to make that walk with some of the mountains. But if you live in these communities, you obviously have no running water when you turn in your tap. So primarily the young women will make a walk, they'll get up at morning, dawn, and they'll make the journey all the way down until they can reach the Mara's Edge, part of the Mara River, and then they'll load jerry cans, which are huge containers of water, on their backs, and they'll make the long walk all the way back up to pour that water that people will use for drinking and bathing. And then often young women have to do that two, three times a day to bring enough water for their families. And of course, for safety and for many reasons, they do that during daylight, and that prevents them from going to school. So you bring a clean water system, and we're going to walk over to it, but it's, it's what Mark's sitting on at the moment, working on his Blackberry. Um, that would be the clean water system that we'll see when the water rolls off the roof of the school or in that case, part of the library, and what looked to us like gutters. But when they catch that water, they'll feed them through the filtration and then eventually into the holding tank deep underground. And so the young women here in the community comes and they can draw water. You know, or on this side, we're going to see when we do our walk that there's a kitchen for a school feeding program that's established. A lot of these kids will only have a cup of tea in the morning before coming to school. So the mamas in the communities and the teachers in the communities prepare food for these students. And they work extremely hard. And for many of the students, especially during the difficult times, it might be the only meal that they receive, really the only square meal they receive during the day. And we'll see how Michelle and the nurses who you've met, and they're the three women who help to greet you when you step off the planes, the community health nurses, they'll come to the school and they'll set up shop and they'll talk about you know, things as simple as washing hands or boiling water and how that prevents germs and spread of diseases. They'll talk about when children suffer from diarrhea. And that's something so simple in North America we don't even think of, but diarrhea is a major killer in many developing countries, including in Africa. To put it in perspective, one in five children in Sub-Saharan Africa don't reach their fifth birthday. Often something as simple as diarrhea. And so talking about how do you mix sugar and salt in the proper ratio for a rehydration mix, and how do you feed that for your child. They'll help and talk about HIV AIDS, leading sessions, and health in the communities. And the school becomes the cornerstone of all of this. And the teachers become the cornerstone of all of this. And the headmaster becomes the cornerstone of all of this. And there's the community that meets and the women who meet as part of the merry-go-rounds. And they meet for the alternative income projects. And so they receive their goats, or they receive small plots of land. And there's now 84 women's cooperatives, and a group of men's cooperatives, and even now youth cooperatives. And with the income they earn, these community members are able to earn enough to literally lift up themselves. 
to put a tin roof on their home, to pay school fees and help provide for the uniform for their children or provide notebooks and pencils so their children can study. So the Free the Children Development Model has those four key cornerstones. Education, water and sanitation, alternative income, and health. And it's really a holistic model. And the idea is if you put any part of those in isolation, something's missing. It's only when all those exist that they interconnect together. Because if you built the school and the school had no alternative income project, well, a lot of those kids have to work and they couldn't afford to send them here. Or if you didn't have the clean water system, well, a lot of those women would have to make a far walk. Or if they didn't have the midday feeding program, a lot of kids wouldn't come. And I think it was once you summed it up so brilliantly when you said when the food stops, the children stop because the children have to work. So by putting all of these programs together, you have to provide an education and health and of gender empowerment and sustainability. And we'll talk more about that. But we wanted you to really just sit for a second in a classroom. To really understand, as a kid who would walk hours sometimes it used to take to get to school, who would work hard at nights, doing all their chores, studying, and there's no electricity, so when they're doing their homework, they're studying by kerosene lanterns. And we met kids who had holes in the blue sweaters that you saw that had these patch holes. And they said it was from studying so hard to have their elbows on the tables. And to make the walk here and to find that they couldn't receive an education that day because teachers weren't here or the walls were leaking or the classrooms had flooded or the dust kicked in or, you know, imagine how disempowering that is for a young person. And this is your education. And this is education for a lot of kids. It's, it's their one big hope. And imagine instead how it feels to have a headmaster who cares about you, and teachers who come to school, and notebooks, and a library full of books to study, and a school that we're going to go into that's brick and mortar, that even when it rains, you stay dry, and you know school won't be canceled because it won't flood. And you know that the goats won't come running in and disturb you through the open door. And you know that it's quiet enough that you can study for your exams, because that's a big deal here. If you don't get your exams, you can't go into secondary school. And so the children in Standard 7 and Standard 8 are busy studying away in their classrooms. And to see how students wear their uniforms with pride, and teachers teach here with pride, and to know that there's a lunch and a feeding program and a community that really comes together to celebrate their students. Because that's what I think is so extraordinary about Anel Rai, to see the pride and the, the hope and the happiness in the eyes of so many teachers. To teach here, to teach with this man is an honor. To, to have your children here, to go to school, to get good high marks. For us, it's, it's so wonderful to see students here who have been given so much by their community. And I know I thank you for the kind words of what you said about Free the Children, but what we did was help provide funding for classrooms. But what you're going to see is that the women brought all the water for the construction. They went down. The men came and laid the bricks. The children walked a far distance to go to school. They really do 99%. And we are just honored to be able to join. It's a small part of it, not 1%. Would you lead us to some of the new classrooms so we get a chance to see what they're like? <laughs> Around the campfire, we'll talk more about the other UN Atlanta development goals. There's seven more to go. <laughs>